with session three. Um, uh, Raven is not able to be with us today. So today for session three, we're going to have Elizabeth Pinio from the University of Maryland College Park and Erin Paul from University of Alabama, Birmingham. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the two of them. All right, let me... There we go. Oops. All right. So hi, everyone. Um, I am Elizabeth Pinio, and my pronouns are she, her. I'm working toward my PhD in information studies at the University of Maryland College Park. Um, because I'm in Maryland, I'd also like to acknowledge the truth that is also that is often buried. I am on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people, who are the ancestral stewards of this sacred land. It's their historical responsibility to advocate for the four-legged, the winged, those that crawl, and those that swim. They remind us that clean air and pristine waterways are essential to all life. And I would also like to acknowledge my own positionality. I'm a cisgender, white, disabled, autistic woman, and that positionality informs and defines my work, which looks at the accessibility of archival materials for disabled users. Archival, Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights grants individuals the freedom of opinion and expression. That right has been interpreted in many ways, including a right to information access, which is a right that many archivists champion. But that right can be impeded when archival materials aren't created in easily accessible ways. For example, today I'd like to talk about finding aids. Originally, according to Gregory Wideman, finding aids were seen as a compromise between the vastness of archival collections and a need to essentially summarize what was in them. They weren't meant to be comprehensive. But even though finding aids were originally intended to function as the first points of contact between archival users and materials, today they often do that. When finding aids aren't created in accessible ways, though, users can't exercise their right to information access. To access a finding aid, a user must be able to discover it. Once they've discovered it, they must also be able to use it and read it in order to take full advantage of the information available. To explore this topic, I surveyed 40 archives finding aids, and I did look at documents that weren't called explicitly finding aids. Some of them were discovery aids, collection guides, that sort of thing. But of those 40, only 26 actually provided access to a finding aid, and those numbers are reflected in the initial summary box on the left. Um, archives might have any number of reasons for not providing online access to finding aids, like privacy concerns, but that count is just for archives that didn't provide online access to any of their finding aids, not just particular ones. So the other three boxes, they are focused on those 26 archives that did have finding aids available online. From there, I applied three metrics to each finding aid, discoverability, usability, and readability. Discoverability, simply put, is how logical the path to a target object is. To examine discoverability, I assess the logic and length of the paths from an archives or library's homepage to the finding gate itself. The discoverability table displays the number of clicks it took to get from an archives homepage to the finding aid. The average was 3.65 and the mode was three. The highest number of clicks was eight and the lowest was two. That length of path is generally fine, but the logic of that path is what's important. I found that the paths in most cases were relatively short, but they were cumbersome and unintuitive. In fact, it was really common to have to conduct a known item search to get to the finding aid, which would make it really difficult to find it if you were just browsing or didn't know what you were looking for. In a few cases, the user even had to navigate multiple tabs combined with known item searches, and those paths were particularly difficult to navigate. I have an example of recording here uh, from the Library of Congress. The path here is only six clicks long, which is still fairly short, but it's very, very confusing. The path you're gonna see me follow here is homepage, researchers, learn more about research and reference services, finding aids, then I'll do a search for the name Robert Gottlieb. It'll open a new tab, um, and then I'll finally be on the Robert S. Gottlieb Recordings of North Indian Tabla from 1956 to 72 finding aid. You'll also notice that a lot of the links I'm clicking on are hidden in paragraphs of text or at the bottoms of pages.
So here, not only is there a lot of guesswork involved in figuring out which link to click to get you where you want to be, but there are some pages that were confusingly titled and almost hidden on some of the pages. So while it might feel unintuitive, a low number of clicks is not necessarily better or more logical. In fact, trying to put everything really close to the surface level can make things more confusing for users. It's better to have a high number of clicks with a really logical path through them because users will stick it out with a long path that they're able to follow that's logical, but they're going to give up on a short path that's confusing. Um, according to what common website navigation principles, discoverability is also enhanced by using common sense search terms on the page itself and promoting the availability of the items so that users know it's there and think to search it out in the first place. Now, archivists might have more or less control over how their websites are structured, but they can use their own experience with archives to share what makes for logical paths to those who are responsible. Um, and they can directly influence the words that appear on a given page, which can in turn influence how well search engines are indexing those pages. To examine usability, I analyze the implementation of Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG, on each page. These are standards created by the World Wide Web Consortium to ensure that web pages can be used by anyone on any device. They're broken up into three levels, A, AA, and AAA. Um, and the middle level, AA, has been incorporated into Title II of the ADA and Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. So all state and federal institutions and any affiliated entities have to follow it now. To conduct this analysis, I use WebAIM's Web Accessibility Evaluation Tool, or WAVE. That tool is really easy to use. You just paste the URL of a page into it and it gives you an annotated version of the page showing where any issues might be. The more errors and alerts it has, generally the less usable it is. So this table shows the average and the mode for the number of errors and alerts found on each of those finding aid pages after they've been run through WAVE. Errors were major issues with the page that might break it for users using access technologies like screen readers. And alerts are issues that would likely cause problems for those technologies, but aren't complete deal breakers. The average number of errors was three and for alerts, 7.95. The mode for errors and alerts was two and one respectively. The most common errors were for structural elements on the page, usually with the HTML and missing ARIA landmarks or other formatting tags, which would tell assistive technologies things like which language to read the page in or how it's structured. Without that information, assistive technologies would struggle to navigate those pages, which means that the users relying on them probably wouldn't be able to fully access them. So of the 26 finding aids I analyzed, there were two finding aid pages that didn't have any alerts and eight that didn't have any errors and only one finding aid page didn't have either. Those numbers need to, and they can change. So the best thing to do um, to address this is to implement WCAG better. And introduction guides on how to do that are linked on the page that QR code on the side takes you to. A lot of it is really straightforward, like using HTML headings while creating the text on those pages. Um, and the World Wide Web Consortium also has a really fantastic checklist that we can follow, also linked there. Finally, to examine readability, I ran a paragraph of text from each finding aid through a Flesh Kincaid reading level checker, which takes into account things like how many words, sentences, and syllables a piece of text has. I looked at just one paragraph from each finding aid because the tool I was using could not handle an entire finding aid worth of text. Uh, but I found that the finding aids were generally written around a 14th grade level for a second year college reading level. The lowest was 7.5 or halfway through seventh grade and the highest was 22.1, which would be equivalent to 10 years of study post high school. Now, according to a Gallup analysis of data from the US Department of Education, 54% of Americans between the ages of 16 and 74 read at or below a sixth grade level. And by extrapolating from data from the National Center for Education Statistics, somewhere around seven or 8% of people in the US has a reading related disability. That means that anywhere from at least 7% to 54% of Americans would struggle to read the material in our finding aids, much less access it. Because the reading levels in the finding aids were so consistently at the college level, it would also be possible that that high end is higher than 54%. So archivists can use things like Flash Kincaid analyzers, and the one I used is linked again through the QR code uh, to check the reading level of the text they're writing. In the future, I would also be interested to see if an AI tool could help us rewrite the immense amount of existing text that we have, but that would be a future project. Um, all of this together is to say that to increase archival information access, Archivists must ensure that finding aids are discoverable, usable, and readable to all. 
increasing access using these metrics will be transformative. So I encourage us all to think in new and exciting ways about what our current finding aids might become. As information professionals, it's our job and our calling to provide information access and finding aids are a really valuable tool to help us do just that. Here are my references. Um, and for links to the tools I mentioned and more information, you can visit the website link to the QR code on screen. And on that note, I will thank you all for your time. Um, and I'll look forward to answering any questions that you might have very shortly. And I'll throw it over to Aaron now. Kind of looking at a specific case study, but using it as a wider view of how we can leverage AI's AI tools um, to help our work in archives. Um, this is specifically focused on GitHub Copilot, but again, it just kind of lends to the idea of how we can use it on a wider scale. Um, so since the background, uh, I'm a digital curation librarian at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And I've been here for a little over a year, focused primarily on our digital collections, digitization, and special collections. Um, so for this case study, um, some background. Uh, we regularly use Python scripts that were written in-house by staff that know how to write scripts. Um, in our digital preservation workflows. I'm not one of those staff members. I don't have any experience with Python or writing scripts. So I'm not really going to be focusing on those. I'm kind of focusing on it uh, in the uh, essence of someone who doesn't know how to do that. Um, for the project, uh, I was working to collect data from websites, uh, essentially creating a web scraping script uh, for a research project and some more kind of detail on that. We needed a tool that could extract large amounts of data from a website. Uh, and essentially a web, web scraping script. Um, the website that I was working with had a number of complexities included. Uh, there was a login screen that you had to get through before you could get to the data. I was intending to scrape about a hundred different fields of data that included a number of different formats, uh, fill in text, drop down, um, selector box or selectors um, and kind of bubbles and just a lot of different variety that added to the complexity. And each of the records I was trying to scrape included multiple tabs on a single page, all associated with, with one record. And so there was a lot that kind of went into this. Uh, so I started out kind of with the easiest option, looking at the Chrome and Firefox web stores. There are a number of free, easily accessible scrapers that already exist. You know, no need to reinvent the wheel if it are, it's already there. Uh, so I tried those out first and ended up trying about seven before giving up because none of them was able to accomplish what I needed. And the best I got was scraping one field from one page. Um, so I moved on to using uh, ChatGPT because I have had been using it for quite a while and had some good familiarity with the product. Um, but again, without a knowledge of scripting, I was essentially just asking or prompting it and saying, like, I want to write a script that does this uh, without really knowing what I was asking. Um, and that started the process off. Uh, it was a lot of back and forth, a lot of circular logic, ran into a number of errors where uh, it couldn't generate a response or, or came up with errors. And it took about two weeks of work before I started making any real progress with it. So it wasn't the quickest process. Um, but my initial script focused on kind of the entire process, uh, limiting the data at the beginning until I kind of got that framework in place. But essentially it was navigate to the site in question, uh, log into the website, 
navigate to the first page that needs to be scraped, scrape one field of data and export that data to an Excel sheet. Um, that introduced a lot of complexities and potential errors and ended up uh, just kind of ending up in kind of a circular loop on ChatGPT where I wasn't making any progress. And I got really close to uh, abandoning the whole process before I saw GitHub Copilot had come out um, and decided to give that a try instead. It is also based on OpenAI ChatGPT, uh, but it's a collaboration with GitHub um, and it's specifically designed for coding or to help with coding. Um, I will add that it does charge, or there is a $10 monthly fee to use it, but if you are a teacher uh, or with an educational institution and you verify your status, you can get access for free. Uh, so I started using this and it's a bit different than a regular chatbot. It's not run kind of through browser, you use it through a software application. Uh, there's a few to choose from. I ended up using Visual Studio without any reason to it besides it worked and it was one of the top ones on the list of options. Um, it is much more designed for people that know how to code as an assistant. So if you're filling in a line of code, it can help finish that line if it knows where you're going. It can add a seg of, you know, code snippets that makes sense logically in what you're doing. It helps with error checking. It helps speed up the process. Um, but again, I don't know how to code. I don't have any background in it. And so I did not use it in that way. Instead, I used it much more as a chatbot uh, and, and kind of a similar feature to ChatGPT, just with a much more focused view. Um, and again, I was essentially just entering prompts and telling it what I wanted to do, adding uh, HTML segments or XPath segments that pointed to data uh, fields and figuring out ways to um, input all of the detailed information I need and then having, letting the uh, software translate that into a script. Um, still ran into a lot of problems, still took a lot of back and forth and occasional uh, loops occurred, but I was able to make a lot more progress. Uh, it also, depending on the length of your script, it also makes you kind of do it in pieces and parts just because it can't generate too long of a response. And so the end result, uh, based on conversations with people who, again, know how to write scripts and code uh, is a bit of a Frankenstein appearance, but it does get the job done. Um, ran into a number of errors in the process. This was a frequent one. Uh, it, it would start generating a response and then stop and say, can't generate it because it's public code. Um, within the system, it says that there is a way to uh, stop this response from happening. You can cut, uh, essentially uncheck a box, but that did not work in my case. And this is a difficult one to get around. Um, and it seemed to come up inconsistently. But with all that being said, I was able to generate uh, about six different scripts that accomplished the goals that I needed to accomplish. Um, I did modify it so that it included a manual component to streamline the script a little bit and make it more responsive. Uh, so I start the script, it navigates to the uh, login page, then I take over manually, log in, navigate to the uh, page that first page I want to scrape, and then restart the script. This eliminated a lot of the errors that I was running into, and it adds um, a layer of security because then my username and password are no longer being stored in the script itself. Um, it does add a little bit of extra time, but it also provides me more control of what's going on and managing that. 
success. Uh, and so I was able to generate that script and a few others and start scraping and extracting data. Um, and with this tool, I've been able to extract uh, over 40,000 uh, entries, which never would have been possible without a product like this. And given my background and my skill set, I never would have been able to do this on my own. Um, I still run into issues when things get updated or if I try to scrape too many pages at once, I'll get errors and I can find ways to get around those or uh, fix those errors a lot better now because working with the system has also increased my knowledge of scripting and writing code and kind of what an error message means, uh, which has been a nice added benefit. Um, and again, this is a very specific use case for this, but I've used AI platforms, chatbots in a number of different parts of my job. It really helps um, areas that you don't know as much about. It helps with generating ideas. There are a lot of applications in a lot of ways that archives, archivists, especially if you're you know, don't have a ton of staff or a ton of uh, expertise in a certain area, it's a really great tool to get you there and uh, it continues to improve. I will say that, that you do need to check it and make sure that it's doing what you want it to do and you're getting the results that you want. Uh, but oh, it has a lot of benefits. And I think part of the need is to find out how we can use it in a way that um, is, you know, doesn't infringe on some of the ethical worries that are involved uh, and see how it fits in to expand our abilities while not taking over uh, some of the more essential functions. But I think it is super helpful and just kind of gives you a better understanding of the wide array of ways that you can use it and the different tools that are out there. Um, that, uh, I think since there's only two of us in this group, that opens it up to questions for either of us now, or again, my email address that's there if you prefer to do that. I have a question for Elizabeth. Um, are you planning to, I, I assume you identified some of the information that, that you felt that the web page didn't give you direct, give a user direct access to the finding aid. Are you going to uh, kindly, gently approach those institutions and as a user maybe suggest that they could improve their page a little bit with, with that? Uh, with those changer? I think it would depend on the situation, how um, directly and specifically I would want to talk to people. Um, I have had some contact with some of the institutions I was looking at. Um, in particular, like if there were situations where it's like, I feel like the finding aid should be on here somewhere, but I'm just not seeing them. So I'd send, um, you know, a note to the, hey, contact us, um, asking how I could find them. And um, sometimes they'd be there. Sometimes they'd say, yeah, yeah they're not, they're not there. Um, so those sorts of interactions I did have. Um, my general preference, I think, um, because I, I, so I plan to continue working on this and creating a larger and larger data set and that sort of thing. Um, so I think it would get a little bit unwieldy at some point to start sending out emails like, hey, you and you and you. Um, but I would not be opposed to having more conversations with people. I think it would just depend on the situation, like how I would want to handle that.
Great. I have. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I have a kind of follow up question for Elizabeth concerning that. Um, how did you work with um, websites where access to the finding aid was not through, say, a page that listed the finding aids, but was purely through a query box, the same way that you would get access to an online catalog. In other words, if you wanted to get access to a finding aid, you put it on a search query, and that would bring up all of the revel relevant finding aids based on that query. Right. So generally, those would... So are you asking, like, if I had to search out the finding aid doing it, like a keyword search, um, did I include them in the analysis or? Uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. I was just, just wondering, well, whether you included them in the analysis and then how, like, say, for usability, well, okay, there's there's no clicks as soon as you end up on the home page. You know, there's the box sitting there in front of you saying, saying, put something in me and find what yeah. you're looking for. Yeah. So I would say generally what I was finding is that there was some sort of clickable object on the homepage that would um, take you to like our collections or um, something like that. Um, and then there would be the search box option at that point. Um, so usually there was something that would take you away from the homepage to get you to the search box. I'm not going to say that was 100% the case, but generally that was what would happen. I saw this particularly with archive space, you'd have to do a search. Um, I did include those finding aids in, um, in the data set because honestly, if I didn't, it would be a really small data set. Um, so that I did include. And then... Um, for usability, or if, yeah, I mean, for discoverability, yes, the clicks were much lower for those. I think generally they ended up being like three, and I think that's probably why the mode was three. Um, but I, I go back and forth, right? My personal preference, like what I would say as a recommendation, just coming from me, would be multiple points of access is almost always gonna be the, the route to go. Um, and having the finding aids hidden behind a keyword search um, is generally not going to super duper facilitate discovery. Um, so the other thing I'll say is, again, with archive space, there would often be like a list of all the finding aids or something like that, or all the search um, results would come up. But it might be like two or 300 things that you'd have to look through. Like there would just be pages and pages and pages of results. Um, and to ask somebody to then go through that volume of stuff at this day and age, the chances that they're going to do that is just so low. Um, but maybe what they're looking for is on page like 199, and you know it would be great for them to find it. Um, so technically, that's multiple points of access, right? Because you could browse that list, or you could do the known item search. Um, but it would also need to be like a practical multiple points of access. Like it has to be something that somebody can actually feasibly do if they're doing some sort of search for a finding aid. Um, I feel like I've rambled a little bit and gone off maybe a little bit to your question, but I hope that answers <laughs> it. <laughs> okay, I, I was just curious. I'm from Clemson University and when you come to, it's pretty much our homepage is pretty much the same as the library's homepage in the sense that the very first thing you do when you come to a homepage, yeah, we have some other pages along the side collections and that sort of thing. But the first thing you see is a search box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and certainly for libraries in particular, that was the way, you know, that was, that was right there on the front. Um, what I generally found is if you try to search like finding aid in there or something like that, or specifically to search out the finding aid, more likely you were going to get like a library book or article, like you'd get like the library results for it. Um, and it wasn't until you actually went into the archive search specifically, or, you know, into the special collections section of the website or something that you would get a search that was really specific to the archive materials, uh, where you would actually get 
stuff that would help you find the fun game, which I thought was really interesting, um, but probably has more to do with backend integration stuff than anything else. I don't know exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. As well. Um, given that it seemed like pretty much everyone's finding aids were above the recommended reading level or the uh, yeah, recommended reading level. Um, did you have a chance to try uh, putting it through an AI service or or kind of reducing that level and seeing what the result was to, to see if it made sense or if it was kind of just like, you know, the finding aid included too many proper names and dates and like too much, many um, required com complex words that increased it artificially. Does that make sense? Fantabulous question. Um, I actually have um, an article coming out at the end of the year. I looked at three different um, um, AIs to see what they could do with this. Because um, it felt like the sort of thing, like this is what they're made for, right? Like put in text, have them spit new text out. Like that is what they're, that's what that's their thing. That's, that's what they're doing. Um, and I would be so curious, honestly, to talk to you more specifically about this after seeing your presentation. Um, but what I found is that I would put in um, the text. I was using the scope and content note paragraphs usually. Um, and I'd say, hey, could you rewrite this at a sixth grade level? Um, and they'd say, sure, absolutely. Here you go. Um, and then I'd put that text through the analyzer and it'd be like the same reading level that I'd put in initially. Um, but they would they'd tell me you know, here it is at sixth grade, but maybe it's still 20th grade, which thanks, I guess. Um, so once I, and I did try like giving them, because Flesh King Kate is based off of like a mathematical formula. So I said, okay, well, these things are computers. I'll, I'm sure they'd love some math. Let's give them some math. Um, and they just, they were totally flummoxed by that, that it did not help. Um, I did find that like, if I gave them prompts, like, could you write this more simply? that sort of thing was more helpful. Um, if I didn't ask for like a specific number grade level, if I just said like write this at middle school level, they would do a better job. Um, but they were generally not, they just didn't want to comply with the request really. Um, as for um, like specific words, making things more complex, definitely that came up. Um, but generally I found with the ones that I was looking at, um, that does seem like the perfect use. Yes, it does. It does seem like the perfect use, Amber. Um, but so sometimes that would come up, but generally they were able to substitute enough words in that they could bring it down pretty significantly. Um, and I tried rewriting some of them myself and I could get them lower, um, you know, and like, do we need to get them specifically to sixth grade all the way? I mean, yes, ideally that'd be great. But if at the end of the day, we need to include, you know, 10 words that push it to seventh or eighth or ninth grade, it's probably not the end of the world because a human can contextually understand that like this name might be really long and maybe it's got multiple last names or something. So where Flesh Kincaid would be like, oh, this is really complex and the reading level goes up. The human understands that like, this is the name and moves on with their life and it's okay. So. Thank you for asking that question. I, continuation, but um, if I mean, there's a lot of these existing ones that are at that higher level, if we went through, you know, as a field and decided to bring them down to a lower reading level, would it make sense, or you know, would you think it made sense to? Uh, almost keep like a research grade and a uh, public user uh, version, both available um, or, yeah. or just kind of get rid of the research one? Yeah, so I think it would, um, in my personal ideal world, um, I would think of something like, you know, like those translation plugins, um, like you can click the button and it'll switch the page from English to whatever other language you want it or vice versa, translate it to English. Um, in my ideal world, we'd have something like that where you would just be able, whether it's built into the archive site itself, it's a browser extension, what have you, um, and it would just rewrite the text, whatever you need, right? I want this higher, I want this lower. Um, and then we don't, 
as archivists need to rewrite an entire corpus, like, you know, thousands of years worth of finding aids, we can just leave that and use technology for what it's used for, um, I think would be a practical way of approaching this. But I am not at all somebody who has the understanding or know how to build that. So I don't know exactly what it is that I'm asking for by saying that. Um, but I feel like that's the sort of thing that should be very doable. But my question would be, would people use that in the sense that that no matter how you phrase it, some people are going to look at this as, as this is a way of dumbing something down. And yeah, that's I think kind of an insult. Important. Yeah, kind of an insult to me that, you know, I have to go and use this thing to make it meaningful to me by essentially reducing the level at which it's written at. And we really shouldn't be surprised because you've got college level people, you know, who have master's degrees for writing this, who have been in, immersed in the whole, you know, uh, higher education writing model. Well, of course we're going to write it at that level. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it makes complete sense. I mean, if you're right, you know, raised in academia, of course, you're going to write in the language of academia. Um, but if you want to make stuff accessible to the world, um, you got to speak the language of the world. Um, and so I would not envision like whatever tool we could create being like, you know, grade one, grade two, grade three, you know, probably more like conversational or um, friendly tone or whatever you could, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a, I don't know what the word would be, but I, you know, I don't know what exactly you would call them, but I think that there would be a way to, um, name the level something that wouldn't feel offensive. Um, but I would feel inclined to say that that would be possible, <laughs> but it's a good point. Yeah. Perhaps like academic version. versus non-academic or academic versus lay audience or something like that. Yeah, yeah, or Laura's just mentioned the popularity of TLDR. Um, we don't see that as summing it down. We're just, it's too long. We didn't read it. <laughs> it's a summary. Yeah. I, would, I would completely use something like that for heavy scientific literature. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a huge benefit because um, I, I read some of that and don't know what half the things in it say. Uh, so having something where I could, even if it did, like, did just say, you know, a dumbing down button on it, I would definitely push that for that type of article. Um, I think since we're in this field, or I assume we're in this field, it's, you understand it better and you know it, but if you're looking at it, if you treat it as if it was a different field that you don't know, it seems much more reasonable, mm -hmm. but I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Um, Amber in the chat says it may be useful for teaching for primary source instruct instructors in grades six through 12. Do you agree, Elizabeth? Teaching primary source. Yeah, I think that could be really great. And especially if um, you've got a bunch of kids who are quite literally at different grade levels and you wanna help them find the way that they're gonna be able to Look at this page and understand what's here i think that would be great too yeah so maybe we have like conversational and other you know non-grade level words maybe we also have grade levels i don't know it could be really interesting great ideas we have a few more minutes does anybody have any more questions or comments I did think of one other thing. When you were talking about the readability level and using, you know, that that French Kincaid reading level tool, the question that I have is when how well my question is how did you decide to use that tool, and is there anything? within that tool that might skew the results. An example would be if, if 
and this is purely off the top of my head, if using a lot of proper names tends to skew the tool toward a higher grade level, yet we use a whole lot of proper names in finding aids because, heck, these are people who are in the finding aid that you might want to learn about, then, you know, the results are maybe not as bad as we think they are. Yeah. Um, so, all right. So the, to answer the first part of your question, I just use Flash Kincaid, not because it's a perfect metric, but because it was, um, it creates output in um, a grade level that matches up with the US education system. So for the sake of comparing that data to existing data, um, it just, it made that comparison doable, frankly. Um, so that was really useful. And then there were also tools available that were easy to use and that could handle what I needed them to do. Um, so it was mostly a decision of like, okay, this will work for me. So this is the metric I will use. There are other reading level metrics out there, um, but this one just suited what I needed to do the best. Um, as for, could we skew the results? Absolutely, we could show results. It's um, you know, it's an equation. If you screw with one variable, um, you can you change the output. Now, what I'll say is Flash Kincaid um, looks at the words, the sentences, and the syllables in a text. So the higher any of those is, um, the higher the reading level it's going to. Generally, like you know, generally speaking, that's what would happen. Um, so yes, like if you were to write out. Um, maybe a one syllable word over and over and over and over and over again, you could make it a really high reading level because the word variable would be so high, right? Um, but generally speaking, like text is written in not that way, right? Like we don't just say the word and over and over and over again just to do it. Um, so it's imperfect, just like any thing's gonna be, like any formula we create for words is going to be imperfect, uh, but I think it's as it's it's functional. Let's put it that way, um, and it does what it needs to do. Um, so I think it's as useful as it's going to get, really. Um, Sarah put. Oh, sorry, <laughs> um, Sarah put a uh, a link in the chat um, for Quillbot AI paraphrasing tool and asked if anyone had tried this out. Yes. Um, I, so when I was doing, um, my initial look at AI tools for this, um, I, I'm trying to think exactly what it was. Quillbot had been, it was slightly different than it is now. I don't remember exactly what the difference was, but, um, it basically goes through like kind of word by word, whereas the things that I was looking at, I wanted them to like really just rewrite the whole text immediately. Um, so at the time, it may have updated since then, but um, you had to kind of click through word by word to get it to look at things. Um, so I think as a tool to figure out alternative words, super awesome. Um, is it going to immediately rewrite like paragraphs and paragraphs of text? Maybe not, but um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a great tool. Um, I I haven't looked at it in a couple of months, so I don't want to be super firm on it though. All right, any other questions? If, if anyone hasn't looked at ChatGPT lately, they, on the free version, um, they just opened up a whole bunch of their uh, like store, uh, some smaller scale, uh, chat products or uh, creations. Um, and so there may be something in there that is now free and available that could do something similar as well. That's more tailored to this. I've not explored that very fully. Change is only maybe a month old. Um, so there, there may be another option in there. It's all changing pretty quickly. I will second that last bit, and it's definitely changing quickly. <laughs> yes, thank you for that. And it's nice to know that there are you know, some free things that you can play around with, especially for the smaller libraries and things like that. Um, 
So thank you guys so much. We're going to go ahead and um, dismiss for lunch. Um, thank you again to Elizabeth and Aaron. Um, we hope you will come back and join us at what time? One o'clock Eastern, 12 o'clock Central. Um, so you guys enjoy your lunch and we'll see you back here in an hour. Thanks. Thank you for putting this together.
All right, everybody, I have 12 o'clock central, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome back from lunch. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with session four. Um, we have Ron McColl, who is from Westchester University of Pennsylvania. Um, and we also have a group from the University of Calgary. We have Jason Nysison, Christina McKillop, and Catherine Ruddick. Forgive me if I've mispronounced any of those names, but we're so glad to have all of you here. Um, and so this, at this time, I will go ahead and turn it over to our presenters. Thank you very much. Um, let me make sure you can see. Everyone can see me and hear me? All right. Um, my name is Ron McCall. I'm the Special Collections Librarian. And um, oddly enough, I'm also the curator of the Darlington Herbarium at Westchester University. And I'm going to talk today about um, the acquisition of the herbarium and the implications of um, that acquisition. And um, I'll give you a little background first to get started. So you have a sense of um, where I'm coming from. So first of all, what is an herbarium? Um, many of you may be familiar already, but um, an herbarium is a uh, collection of dried plant specimens. And um, these have been collected since the Middle Ages. Um, and they really took off in the, during the Renaissance and really haven't stopped since. There are collections in certain places in the world that number in the um, uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of specimens. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about ours, and that is the Darlington Herbarium in a moment. And um, I'll try to touch on why we acquired it and how we moved it in this section. So the Darlington Herbarium is named for uh, the gentleman on the left, uh, William Darlington. He lived from 1782 to 1863. And he was a native of Westchester, the town in which um, his collection still remains. Um, he was also a precursor in many ways to the university itself, having started an academy that would eventually morph into uh, the normal school, which is now eventually uh, Westchester University. On the right, there's a picture of the herbarium um, in the mid 20th century with the professor demonstrating um, or, or teaching with a specimen sheet of a plant and students. And the background here is that um, in the fall of 2019, the science department, uh, particularly the biology department, which had traditionally been housing the herbarium, um, was told by the dean that they were going to lose that space because they were uh, trying to hire a new faculty member and they were gonna entice them with um, more research space or lab space. And when um, the decision was being made, the, the thought was, well, they'll store the herbarium in a, in a storage trailer somewhere. And when I heard about this, um, I, I knew a little bit about the background and I felt like that was going to be um, a real loss because I, I figured that uh, it would quickly deteriorate in such conditions and it would also not be accessible, not be used. And it has tremendous historical significance. Um, many very important botanists um, have specimens in the collection. So um, it really was worth preserving, but were we the right people to do it? Um, I guess the rationale primarily was based on the fact that um, we already had uh, a lot of affiliated or supplemental uh, materials we had for instance, Darlington's library, which you can see in the middle here in our, in our collection. We had other artifacts of his, like his quadrant pictured on the right. We have his letter books, um, copies of hundreds of letters that he sent over decades, um, uh, documenting his correspondence with many of the people with whom he exchanged plant specimens. So um, it, it fit in that sense uh, within our collections, but nevertheless, it was a, a a different thing for us to do and, and a real challenge. Um, 
an herbarium lives typically in cabinets and these are uh, the cabinets as we were bringing them in and then um, rehousing the specimen sheets and they are arranged according to genus and then species and so on. Um, this was very challenging. This we this work we began doing physically moving these across campus ourselves on carts after boxing um, the folded uh, specimens, and um, this was done in the winter time of nineteen to twenty, and then the um, um, pandemic uh, shut us down. So we. <laughs> had specimen sheets spread out everywhere in special collections. We had just brought them all over before we were shut down, but nevertheless, they were left in a kind of perilous um, state and we did lose some to a leak we had in the building while we were not there for about a year. Um, the steel cabinets were brought over by facilities on campus because they are tremendously heavy. So we faced some challenges obviously in um, taking on this collection in um, curating it and um, providing access to it. Um, and some of these things were, were things I really didn't know, uh, to be quite honest. And I'm still learning a lot about what it means to take care of an herbarium. I am not a botanist. And so that is maybe the number one challenge. Cataloging is the first obvious issue. Um, we have two of the book, uh, books, two books that look like the one on the left. These are manuscript uh, record books documenting uh, or, or basically cataloging uh, the collection as it stood in the 1820s and then again in the 1840s um, when it was updated from the Linnaean system to the uh, natural system, uh, botanical arrangement. And yet there's really little we can do with these books that it's obviously not um, very useful for searching, although we do we do depend on them once in a while. Uh, it also came with a card catalog um, in the mid 20th century. Um, cards had been made for each of the specimen sheets, and these are arranged by the name of the donor. So um, and then alphabetized by genus species. So. Uh, again, an awkward way to um, access or discover uh, a particular species. At times, each of these have come in handy, but um, we have also uh, digitized the collection at this point, so I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. So the digitization process was really a, a stroke of luck. We um, reached out to an area consortium that had obtained a grant and had been for a couple of years digitizing already. And they were more than happy to loan us the uh, camera and equipment on the right that we then used to um, scan all of uh, 20,000 plus specimens from the collection. And they are now living on this consortial um, uh, database that um, includes the herbaria from a few dozen, I think it's at least a couple dozen now, um, different collections in the mid-Atlantic area. So another challenge I've faced are uh, research questions. Here's a, here's a typical one that's come in. Um, and you know, I, the fact that I'm not a botanist, um, but nevertheless, I've, I've studied a lot of the history around um, William Darlington and, and his practice. Um, I get questions like this and I, and I, I really have to I really have to think and I have to consult um, resources that I'm not typically uh, consulting many of the times, much of the time, these species names that uh, he had used at the time are no longer, of course, in use. They've been superseded. There's something's happened. Um, and so uh, I have to do my own homework every time. And we also have the uh, added issue that the circulation, uh, that the collection circulates. Uh, that's typical of herbaria or I guess other natural history collections, but especially herbaria. And here's an example of something that can happen because of that. Um, this is a, a, a bound volume from 1826 that has 189 specimens in it. It was collected by two women in Canada and, and sent to um, William Darlington. And um, it's one bound volume. Now, I didn't even know this had been on loan. This was borrowed 25 years ago. 
just came back to us this year. And um, this illustrates some of the issues that can happen with that. This To get this back um, required a series of a couple of dozen interview, um, emails uh, during which it was suddenly discovered that there were endangered species uh, in the collection and that they could not cross the border. And um, so this email kind of uh, explains some of the challenge we faced there and how we did it. Eventually, we did get it back. It was sent to another institution that has CITES um, qualification, and we finally got it, got it back after 25 years. So we've had some really positive outcomes from the acquisition. Uh, and here's just some, some bullet points, but I'm going to go through um, and, and explain some of these in a little bit of detail. We have attracted attention from the campus and from the local press. Um, and the campus has been really good now about also pushing out um, information about the herbarium. Or here's a recent exhibit we um, opened that includes uh, specimen sheets um, and runs right up to our current efforts in sustainability on campus. We've used it uh, in our social media and it's really attracted a lot of attention there and it's brought in a whole new audience and it's been a way to um, sort of connect with with other people locally and, and nationally, even internationally that we had never expected to be working with. Another thing that happened, and this was through social media, we had a post about the herbarium uh, a couple of years ago, and a woman who works, I believe, at Northwestern University um, saw our post and knew that her family owned this uh, 19th century herbarium that runs to probably 500 plus uh, specimens collected by a relative of hers, um, Sarah Coates Harris. She had first uh, lived near Westchester and then moved to Illinois. The collection was actually in um, uh, this woman's parents' attic in, I believe, Arizona. And it was eventually shipped to us in several boxes. And so we've been working through this um, collection, uh, in, which includes a lot of specimens that were exchanged between women of the time. So we're, we're working to try to identify more of them. Uh, the herbarium has also, you know, really enhanced our programming and outreach. We live in an area that is um, really um, blessed to have a lot of gardens and a rich botanical history. So people are already interested in the area in this type of thing. And what we've been able to do with the herbarium is much different than what the um, part-time curator, uh, who was actually, you know, a, a professor in the biology department, was able to do with it. Uh, really only opening opening it for research appointments on rare occasion and um, not obviously pu publicizing it much at all. Um, so one thing we're really excited about is the fact that we are going to be able to identify many women, both um, in the Darlington herbarium and then uh, in this recent acquisition as well, um, and to recover these women who were working in science or um, performing citizen science at the at the time. Um, and these are just some of the names that we are working to um, tell their tell stories about. We've also been lucky. Um, the uh, herbarium has been cited or used, or, or uh, its related stories and and those of Darlington and so on have recently appeared in several publications. These are all books here, but there are articles as well that have come out. And um, again, really revealing uh, some of these forgotten stories. Um, and forgotten figures. So some lessons we learned were that um, natural history collections are, are non-native species, perhaps, to special collections and archives, but they are not necessarily invasive. Uh, researchers value access and preservation of their expertise. I've yet to have anyone complain that I don't know enough, <laughs> although I certainly don't know enough. I don't know botany really well at all, but I do really like the, um, the kind of the cultural heritage uh, that's embedded in it. And that's because I see herbaria as participating in, in very rich social and textual networks that do line up with my own research interests and the things we already were doing. And um, basically, we've learned that if you rebuild it, people and plants will come. Thank you.
are we jumping in for ours now or are we doing questions? Yes, questions you can go ahead. We'll save questions for the end. <laughs> Great. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jason Nissenson. I am the Archivist for Literary Collections at the University of Calgary. My colleague, Catherine Ruddick, is the Director of Digital Services. Christina McKillop is our Librarian for English, and she is not able to join us today, so we will speak to her work. Slide. Take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Districts 5 and 6. <clears throat> so I'm going to give a quick introduction to Winifred Eaton Reeve and to our project related to her. Then Catherine will give an overview of that project. And lastly, we will finish with our highlights and takeaways. Winifred Eaton Reeve was a Canadian novelist and screenwriter. She was born in Montreal in 1875 to an English father and a Chinese mother. She died in Butte, Montana in 1954. Reeve wrote extensively under the Japanese sounding pseudonym Onato Watana, and she achieved success with her novels, short stories, and screenwriting. <clears throat> Her writing career began in 1895 when she published her first story in a Montreal-based serial, and then she also briefly worked as a reporter in Jamaica, just for about five months. In 1899, she published her novel, Miss Nume of Japan, and I think that likely makes her the first person of Asian descent to publish a novel in the United States. And from after that, she set off on a prolific, successful, and long writing career. In terms of her personal life, uh, she married writer Bertram Babcock in 1901. They had three children and divorced in 1917. She then married businessman Francis Reeve, and the couple moved to a ranch near Calgary, but separated from 1924 to 1931, during which time Reeve went to Hollywood and wrote and edited for MGM and Universal Studios. She reconciled with Reeve in 1931 and returned to Calgary, where she founded the Little Theatre Movement and led the Calgary branch of the Canadian Authors Association. There were several good reasons for choosing Reeve's papers to digitize. The collection is one of our most consulted literary archives, and so this was a way to preserve these relatively fragile materials to the creation of a digital surrogate. Reeve material is also mostly in the public domain, so fewer copyright concerns. It was a chance to highlight Asian Canadians in our holdings. And the project coincided with a planned symposium on Reeve that was held at University of Calgary in July of last year. So when we started it in July, 2022, we had about a year from start to finish to get everything done. Hopefully sooner than that, so that those researchers that were working on things for the symposium would have some digital content to use in their presentations and work. Um, so that was the first thing. We need to digitize this whole phone. Um, our archival processing team and subject archivists identified a need to rearrange the phone, add more description, and refolder materials. Um, and during that process, we hope to be able to add some of the metadata that was generated from the archival description. Uh, that we could use downstream in the digital collection. Flag some items that may need uh, different reviews for like privacy concerns and create new thematic access points outside of the archival hierarchy um, that we could use for curated packages. So things like um, getting the story through lines from letter to the final product and um, the different drafts and those kinds of things. Um, everything from the phone needed to be digitized, processed uh, for transcription and organized. And the digital collection needed to be designed for user needs, adding some item level metadata and published. Finally, uh, we wanted to create an, that element of curation to associate those objects in the phone by story 
or other impactful themes that were um, discovered as we went through all the materials. We tend to organize, organize ourselves functionally on these kinds of projects, meaning that the various service leads were responsible for organizing their work or their team's work um, and requesting support for their project deliverables from other teams as needed. What you're seeing here at the top is our project sponsor, who was our associate university librarian, and she managed both our archives and digital services portfolios at the time, so that was helpful. Um, and then at that top layer would be those functional or service leads. When you're seeing a solid line, that's typically a direct reporting relationship. Um, or in the case of Christina, our subject librarian, she didn't have any direct reports to, but she would have responsibility for all of those deliverables. A, a dotted line means there's not a direct reporting relationship. All of our team members who had an active role on the project were invited to monthly check-in meetings to share progress, discuss challenges, ask questions as we went along. I served in a coordinator capacity, meaning that um, I managed our monthly meetings, ensured that we had details about all the elements that we laid out at the beginning of our project and um, got updates, made sure that we had those coordinated. Um, but I was also responsible for delivering a lot of our deliverables and coordinating my team. So I didn't have a formal project management role um, or a project manager role. We don't have project managers in our, our organization for this kind of thing. We just tend to work like this in a coordinated fashion. In lieu of a clear lead, we instead organize ourselves so that those various functional leads come together to review things and they come up and make decisions collectively if there's any questions. Our monthly check-ins are really important for us in this kind of structure. Um, and here is a brief demo of the digital collection. So at the top, you're gonna to see a general collection description with a sensitive content notice um, added due to some of the terminology, visuals, and themes that we discovered during the course of the project. The collection's arranged um, in a gallery view by archival series, uh, browsable or searchable. And we're gonna go into correspondence and then a subseries personal correspondence and then you can open up any of the documents in there. And the photographs are from across our digital collections, not just from within the phone, anything that was about Winifred Eaton Reeve. And Winifred Eaton Reeve would have her authority record description uh, and a flat search across all of the content in the collection. We did complete the project in time for the previously mentioned symposium that was held last July here at University of Calgary. Uh, the site, the collection that Catherine just demonstrated was launched and discussed there. Christina, who is not with us, created and made public a research guide for Winifred Eaton Reeve, also in time for the symposium, which she attended and where she presented on this guide and how to use it in the classroom. The symposium was also an opportunity to clarify the difference between the University of Calgary's Winifred Eaton Reeve phone or archive versus the online scholarly archive of Reeve materials created by Dr. Mary Chapman at the University of British Columbia. She's a major Reeve scholar and a chief organizer at the symposium. And you'll see what I mean if you were to Google Winifred Eaton Reeve archive, you will find uh, her website and not ours. So among this group in particular, it was necessary to make that distinction. So this slide shows uh, the use of the Winifred Eaton Reeve phone um, and the different access points and tools that we created during this project. The first thing that you're gonna see is the dominant numbers of the digital collection um, over the last 12 months about. Um, going over 17,000 views in one month, for example. Um, at the bottom, you're gonna see the gray line is the LibGuide um, usage. And while these are 
like lower, much lower than the digital collection views. Um, we're reaching about 20 to 70 faculty, staff, or students per month, or that's typically the audience that we see from LibGuides, um, which is actually pretty good for us. Um, and like we're satisfied with that as a, as a reach for that audience. The reading room or physical archive access, we did not track that well over this time period. When the boxes of materials were taken out for digitization or demonstration purposes, we didn't track end user box retrieval. Um, and the digital collection publishing would have impacted our use of the physical materials during this time. Um, so when we published in June, 2023, our, that would be the first point of referral. If anybody's asking about when Freddie read and read content that we have, we would have directed to the digital collection. But we do recall that uh, the conference attendees in summer 2023 were using the materials or viewing them in the reading room. The one value that you're going to see, or there's one black dot right here, <laughs> um, and that would, uh, there was 11 boxes retrieved um, by one user in March. Um, and they did a deep dive into those boxes, uh, despite everything being available online. So um, needless to say, the project required really deep collaboration between different units, um, metadata differences between archival and digital collections in particular resulted in more work than usual for the archival processing team, which isn't necessarily used to describing material down to the item level, which is what's necessary in digitization. As well, like many older collections, there is sensitive content, Catherine touched on that earlier, and themes in Reeves' phones. Some digitization created an opportunity to work on a shared strategy for dealing with this. Um, and at the start of the project, we decided we were going to digitize everything. It was probably like three of us at, at from those functional leads. We're like, yeah, let's do everything. Um, we were already, tu already touching everything due to this rearrangement. We knew that the materials were quite fragile and highly popular. It just made sense to do everything one time. Um, but we used that word all and we didn't consider those edge cases. Uh, I'm not an archivist. I don't have that experience of doing that appraisal process during arrangement and description. Um, and during the course of that arrangement and description and digitization, the word all became a bit of a lone stone for our team members that had to do the actual work. Um, in digitization, for example, we had uh, when we had like a print photograph and the negative, a decision should have been made of, do we need to do both? Or is there a value in doing both? Or do we just need one of these to represent within the digital collection? Or if there was a short story in a magazine, do we digitize that whole magazine to capture the whole, um, the story in, in its context or just the short story? So those kinds of decisions, there needs to be room for that when we use the term like all, uh, in the future, if we ever had used an absolute word like all in a project where we're saying we're digitizing everything, we'll incorporate a review and selection element at each phase and, um, so that our team members can use that as more of a vision statement rather than a weight that they have to do everything if they don't see the value. Yeah, I, I agree. I think um, the instinct for completeness to say just do it all. Uh, that can interrupt or complicate the actual advantages of a digitization project. And Catherine and I have certainly discussed this in light of the many, many hours of work required for proper digitization. And so considering this, it does seem to make better sense to be selective and drive the user back to the finding aid to communicate, hey, you know, there's also more to see over here if you'd like to come in and view it in person. The most compelling outcomes of this project for me have emerged from our post-completion discussions. Within our library, there is an initiative tentatively labeled digitization first, still a hazy concept. So we're really trying to figure out what it means, but it seems to advocate very generally for a paradigm in which users seeking access to archival collections will be directed first to digital asset management systems. And there's some worry about this idea that we were trying to get in front of directing access to archives through digital asset management systems, which allows entry into objects in so many different ways, 
potentially threatens our ability to communicate provenance and original order. But I think nevertheless, the power of digitization, especially as we advance into an AI-driven future, offers significant advantages of access and discovery. From a user perspective, the benefits include completely OCR documents, enabling keyword access and filtered searches across font and collections. There's so much more it enables too. I mean, just earlier this week, I was at a conference presentation where it was suggested that AI systems can also enable instant translation into many languages of digital material, which just illustrates the incredible potential for enhancing discovery. So does a digital archive threaten the traditional hierarchical context of a finding aid? Maybe, but it also opens up a myriad of exciting new possibilities. And for me, this digital access first or even access first becomes a really important frame as we just start thinking through uh, these projects as ideas and develop a shared set of goals and objectives. Um, this helps upset this helps us set the user at the center of our work and our effort instead of what we think that they want to do. What do they actually want to do? Um, really understanding our primary audience, user scenarios and use cases in order to see what uh, we can give up in our current process because we'll never be able to do all the description ever um, is really important as we have limited resources. Here's also where our data collection falls short. Um, and understanding those user needs. So I'd really love to know more about that researcher who requested those 11 boxes in March and that unique research value in handling those physical materials. Um, what were they able to glean? What, what's their story? Like we see these obviously massive numbers within the digital collection, but we also know that those aren't the those aren't all people that are going to publish on Winifred Eaton Reeve or do these deep dives into research. We know that there's a, a different learning value from handling those materials. So getting those data stories are really important as for us to understand and shed light, as they say, on how these kinds of um, users use our materials in these different forums. I think that's that's it. And we wanted to thank our project uh, team members. We were just representing them up here, um, but we had a lot of people that worked on this project over that year. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, at this time, we'll go ahead and open it up for questions. Um, you're welcome to unmute yourself or you can uh, put it in the chat um, and we'll be glad to take your questions and comments. Well, I, I have a question for Ron. Ron, um, yeah. so I was curious, I mean, looking at your, um, what you digitized, looks like really, really fragile material. I mean, Winifred Eaton Reeve, she's paper and photograph based, but, and you mentioned you alluded to um, allowing access by appointment previously under another curator, but how do you do it? Like, do you get a lot of requests to handle the material physically now? How do you deal with that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, we don't get a lot of requests um, uh, to just come in and handle specimens. Um, but I, you know, I'm welcome to that if if people want to. Um, I still think, you know, they definitely. It's of course we have this, you know, this issue with with any uh, material, right? The difference between the digitized and the and the print form or the paper form, um, and with specimens it's it's even more pronounced um because um well like i said they they circulate um they'll researchers will want to perform uh, dna extraction um they're they're actual you know really interacting with the specimen at times so um and that you know they'll often if they're examining a specimen they'll pull out their hand lens and they'll and they'll really want to you know take a close look which is something, you know, the flat 
uh, digitized version is not going to offer at whatever resolution. So um, some of that I can't get around. You know, they're they're still gonna they're still gonna use the physical, um, and I don't mind because it's really not getting heavy use in that sense. What we are seeing though is a lot of access to the the digitized form, um, and that's because researchers from around the world, you know, are seeing it. Um, it's just it's just reaching a much larger network. So. I'm yeah. curious too, Ron. Um, it, are there spe like special archival supplies that you have to order to, <laughs> to take care of these, or can you use your just, you know, run of the mill paper and photograph type supplies? No, that's a good question too. Um, so uh, yeah, there are you know the specimen sheets themselves are um, cut to a certain size, and and they're things you can order. Um, then they're foldered as well. Um, and of course, these are all, you know, archival quality, just like we would use for anything else. But um, there are um, mounting materials that are required. So um, and those techniques have changed over time, but um, specimens can still be uh, sort of taped to the sheet. Um, real difficult com conservation, though, is not something I am ever going to probably do, um, but we have very generous partners who have offered to take um, entire sections of our collection and and uh, conserve them for us or, or mount specimens. Uh, we have some sub collections that aren't even mounted. Um, so they're just, the specimen would be between folded pages, but it's not mounted to a page at all. So there's some really delicate stuff in there too. Yeah, great question. Uh, Ron, we're probably going to have to follow up with you because it's getting floated over here. <laughs> if we're going to have to do this too. We worked on a digitization project with the herbarium in 2016, mm. um, which was great. And now they're losing their space. And it was always run by faculty members um, at University of Calgary before. Yeah. So now we're like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> You've done that. Yeah. <laughs> but like, the space requirements and the moving requirements for these we may have to follow up with. <laughs> yeah, I, I, mean, I don't know that I'll have an answer for you, but that was definitely a challenge. I did not take everything that was there. I took the historical collection and a couple of smaller supplemental collections. One was just the, the, the collection of two um, teenage uh, girls from the 19th century um, from town that someone had found um, maybe a couple decades earlier in an attic when they bought it, bought a house in town. And so, you know, things like that that have local value, I, I tried to take, but there was a lot that I didn't. Um, so, you know, that's part of it. You, you oh, probably so you can't take all of it, yeah, but you got to figure out where to draw that line. Yeah. Um, but this is happening a lot. Um, I don't know that libraries are taking it quite often, but, um, you know, you, you heard probably about the Duke Herbarium um, and it's, it's being disbanded or, you know, um, shipped out. <laughs> They're getting rid of it. So yeah, it's been, it's been all over the press. NPRs run stories on it and it's, it's really uh, a touchy subject with a lot of people. So um, mm -hmm. yeah. It was cool though, because um, we also, I mean, so we digitized the content and, you know, the usual stuff with OCR and everything like that. Um, and then we had all these archival records about, the collectors that we yeah. like you know that all of a sudden you're discovering with that we had that as part of the in our digital collections already so it's like oh that's so neat you know like we have yeah. all these society papers and everything like that so you, like that context is slightly coming through from the different areas of the collection yeah exactly it's plugged into the circuitry then yeah yeah so i have a quick question uh for ron you you mentioned the just now the collection of the the two girls has has anyone else uh tried to add to your collection if you had anyone who's tried to donate things now that you have this herbarium just the just the one that i i mentioned um and i i know i went through my presentation very quickly i was still sticking to the 10 minute rule for some reason um so that one we got uh in I haven't counted the specimens yet, but it's a it's a nice substantial um, collection from a, a woman named Sarah uh, Coates Harris, 
And um, like I said, it, it passed through her family for generations and, and, and was just chance that someone saw we had the Darlington collection um, and knew that she knew Darlington at some point. And that's because she was born in Chester County where, where we are. And, and yet she had moved to the Midwest and done a lot of collecting there, became a doctor. Um, so she was a really interesting person. Um, and then, um, you know, I've had other small um, offers and, and so on, but it really, it's got to be something like that, I think, for me to supplement our collection because we really don't have any more room. Um, and so I've got to be picky. But I'm sure there is more out there. That's the thing. Uh, that's what this tells me. Um, and it's a shame that, you know, I, I'm sure these things are not being well preserved. But um, it's great when you do make a discovery like that. Um, I had a question for um, Catherine and Jason. Um, your presentation reminded me of um, a project that we did last year. We digitized um, the Eudora Welty collection. And I know with that and with any writers, um, uh, anything like that, you uh, sometimes come across like copyright issues and like that and that sort of thing. So I was wondering if you guys had any issues with digitizing this collection with having to deal with copyright issues and whatnot. It was so funny. So um, we chose it because oh, everything's supposed to be out of copyright. And then there was a change in Canadian copyright law, like in December <laughs> midpoint. So like we moved to the 70 years, like at, with the USMCA. So then we had to re, we had to introduce that whole component and like reevaluate everything for is everything out of copyright again? So some of the things aren't. <laughs> Uh, but that's why we chose it initially, because we're like, oh, yes, it was death uh, plus 50 in Canada. And then with USMCA, we did the death plus 70 um, in December 2022. No, 2020. Yeah, is that right? 2022? I think that's right. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, that was a surprise for us. And then, yeah, that was one of our surprises from this project. <laughs> I think that's one of my biggest fears as an archivist is that I'm going to do something like going against copyright and all that. You know, we try to make sure that we check everything and we have um, an archivist on staff who's like pretty well trained and we always, you know, go go by her when, ha when we have a copyright questions and whatnot. But yeah, I know that always kind of scares me. <laughs> yeah. And that, oh, that was also an interesting thing for us. So um, in the archival description, like the creator is like the creator of the font or the collection, right? Who was collecting this whole thing? Um, and when we're doing item level and when we're doing copyright review, like creator of the object, right? Like that's how we're checking copyright permissions. So there was like a misalignment in that interpretation of that term. We're like, no, no, we need to know who is the author of this thing so that we can see if they're, when they died. <laughs> <laughs> Not all wonderful to eat and read. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so that was one of the things between the different levels of uh, metadata that were like, oh, okay, we're interpreting interpreting crater differently here. <laughs> yes, yes. I also sometimes wonder if maybe I should have gotten like a secondary like law degree or something just to make <laughs> to make sure I can cover my bases. <laughs> but it does come in handy sometimes. I can tell you that. Much. Any other questions or comments? Gabby said, gotta love fair use. <laughs> All right, well, if that's, if no one else has anything to add, we'll go ahead and um, 
go on a little break. Thank you guys so much. These were really interesting presentations. Um, we appreciate you guys uh, being here and, and giving these awesome presentations. Um, we'll go ahead and take a break and come back at 115 Central, 215 Eastern. So we'll see you guys then. Thanks.